every moment of my life, every moment of my life, yeah, oh yeah, oh, I leave this earthly thing, so I will listen to your words. Display my faithfulness so true Because you gave your life for me Now I will give my life to you, to you. It's such a joy and pleasure once again to be with you on this The Know Your Bible We are delighted to be here on Church Media TT on this YouTube uh, We hope certainly that you are with us at this early hour I know it's for some people, seven is, they say, okay, even we are getting ready to go to service, you know, but we have a little device on and we are tuned in. Uh, at least you can hear, you don't always have to see, you don't have to see me, but if you hear the voice, that's what's important. to get the message, right? So please try to spread the word around. Remember, as Christians, this provides us with a ready evangelistic tool. Many Christians say, I, I don't know who I can study with. Oh, I don't know if I can carry a Bible study. But well, here it is. We are giving you the tool in your hand. Ready made. Just point people to it. Send them a text. Say, we have a program on Church Media TT on YouTube. It premieres at 7 every Sunday morning. Of course, it is there all the time. So you could go back and review. But we want you to get it first time out. And if you go there, it's just short. It's about 15, 15 minutes thereabouts. And it talks about the plan of salvation the need for 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 us to obey the gospel of christ and therefore if you go there you can learn things about what is required for your eternal salvation so please point people there okay and maybe we'll have a lot more folks because if you send it to 15 20 persons and one only respond but we have 100 persons christians doing that then you have a hundred people on. Sometimes we never look at it like that. But I urge every Christian, if you are viewing, make it a point of interest to share this and let people know they have opportunity to hear the gospel. Let's ask God to give us his guidance as we give thanks. Father, we are eternally indebted to you, O God, the creator of this magnificent universe in which we live, the God of our eternal salvation, who gave up his only son to pay the price for sin that we could not pay. Thank you, God, for caring and for making it possible for us to come to build a new relationship with you and to have and to experience the freedom of forgiveness and to live each day with the confident assurance that we have eternal life with you, O God. Thank you for the Holy Spirit and thank you for your word that tells us what you require of us so that we may not be left in the dark or left to the unscrupulity of those who are divisive and who seek to esteem only themselves by corrupting and changing your word, Father. We know there are many who innocently have a desire to serve you and believe what they are told. But we ask, O oh God, that you will help us to reach into the hearts of those who are seeking and searching, that they may see clearly the truth that is on the page of inspiration. We ask a blessing. I ask for your guidance and for your strength. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Okay, as we continue our discussion on looking at the question, should Christians keep the Sabbath? We are actually looking at uh, early uh, first century Christian practice and as we look at that we have not seen any evidence that the early church were ever commanded by the apostles to observe the Sabbath nor were there any examples of them assembling on the seventh day rather we saw the apostles going to the synagogue on the Sabbath day so that they could reason with the Jews in the scriptures teaching them that the Christ was crucified, buried, and rose the third day. Of course, that's important. And then we see examples of the early church, Acts chapter 20, assembling on the first day of the week. 
we see the phrase were gathered together and that means being a passive participle the gathering was not voluntarily voluntary it was called by someone else it was through divine instruction that they were called together to assemble on the first day of the week we also saw that the saints in Corinth were assembling on the first day of the week and Paul told them to give their collection for the poor saints when they came together on the first day of the week so that when he came through Corinth he would be able to pick it up from one location that's very important then we saw that John the Revelator on the Isle of Patmos made a statement in Revelation 1 and 10 that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day and the word Lord in that text actually means relating to the Lord it's not the word kurios it's the word kupiakos and it means relating to the Lord so when John says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day he was saying he was in the spirit on the day relating to the Lord and that day is the resurrection of Christ from the dead as you look at other scriptures you realize that many of the early Christians especially those who were Jews who were serving under the Old Testament when they converted had a hard time breaking off completely from that old system so they wanted to hold on to certain things and Paul in Romans 14 had to really uh, uh, admonish them and try to help them to understand that that old system is no longer in force God has removed it he's taken it out of the way and so Romans 14 Paul says now accept the one who is weak in faith but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions one man has faith that he may eat all things but he who is weak eats vegetables only <laughs> You know it sounds hilarious but Paul is trying to regulate you know dietary practices especially when those who were under the old system abstained from certain things and now they were taking that rigid firm position and making it a test of salvation that if you ate this kind of meat you definitely won't see God as a matter of fact I read I remember reading reading somewhere in one of Ellen G. White's uh, pieces of work where she says it's just as much a sin to eat a piece of pork as it is to commit adultery yes so you know when you see things like that you begin to wonder how people analyze and, and read the scriptures to understand what God is saying there's a thing called context which is very important you cannot ignore so when when Moses appeared to the Israelites in Deuteronomy 5 and he says here O Israel understand the context you know here it is God is giving him instructions at Sinai and he's calling all Israel in the context those who were delivered out of Egypt so you know it has relevance to them you can't take that and say Moses is talking to everybody in the world no not everybody in the world is under Egyptian bondage so it's important then as we said record of post apostolic patristic writers are important to consider as well as we look at this early Christian practice for the first three centuries of Christian history the testimony is uniform that the original disciples of Jesus Christ worshiped on the first day of the week not on the Sabbath not on the seventh day now in 8120 there's a document called the didache which declares that every Lord's Day they say the Christians gather themselves together and break bread now you have what you call the anti-Nicene fathers and they have written uh, volumes that give indication of what was happening during that time what they saw what the early Christians were doing and so anti-Nicene fathers volume 7 point 381 gives us this information that we could see that they are saying that every Lord's Day not just once every Lord's Day the Christians gather themselves and they broke bread that's the Lord's Supper in what is called the Epistle of Barnabas 8120 
This is historical information now. We're not talking of the inspired book, okay? In discussing such things as incense, new moons, and sabbaths, says that the Lord abolished these things in deference to the new law of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's ANF anti nicene Fathers, uh, volume 1.138. Later it is affirmed, Wherefore also we keep the eighth day with joyfulness, the day also on which Jesus rose from the dead. So you look at history and you see what it is saying. Justin Martyr, 8140, somebody that people talk about all the time, declared that on the day called Sunday, quote, he says, on the day called Sunday, unquote, the primitive Christians met for worship. He further stated that this was the day on which Christ was raised from the dead. Clement of Alexandria, 8194, spoke of the one who, quote, keeps the Lord's day, unquote, as glorifying the Lord's resurrection in himself. Tertullian, 8200, argued that the, quote, old law had been consummated, thus the observance of the Sabbath is demonstrated to have been temporary, unquote. Elsewhere he says that, quote, Sabbaths are strange, unquote, to Christians, and that they share together the Lord's day. It shows us clearly. Eusebius, 324 AD, known as, quote, the father of church history, recognized as the father of church history, stated that the Sabbath observant does not, quote, belong to Christians, unquote. On the other hand, he asserted that Christians celebrate the Lord's day in commemoration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Noted historian Philip Schaff concludes, here's what he says, quote, the universal and uncontradicted Sunday observance in the second century can only be explained by the fact that it had its roots in the apostolic practice. Remember, Paul said something in 1 Corinthians 14:37. He says, if any man is a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I, Paul, write unto you, that they are the commandments of the Lord. So the apostolic practice did not include seventh-day observance. They always were on the first day of the week, except when they went to convert people to Christ. So finally, we must make this comment as we made before. I want to remind you, it is incorrect to refer to Sunday as the Christian's Sabbath. The Christian does not have a Sunday Sabbath or a Saturday Sabbath here in this life under the New Covenant. The Jews had a seven-day Sabbath and many other Sabbaths that they would have observed during their lifetime. But the Sabbath signified rest. And it was a physical rest from physical bondage. It reminded them that God delivered them out of four centuries of suffering, hardship and toil, and finally gave them freedom so that they could become a nation in the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. Now in the second instance, in addition to the concept of first century Christian practice, Old Testament Sabbath considerations are also important. And perhaps looking at that, we are going to observe several things there that you see under the Old Testament. As you look at Sabbath requirements under the Old Testament era, it is helpful to point out that there were many other Sabbaths in addition to the seventh day Sabbath, which the Hebrews were required to keep. And, and that's something which a study can be made of and there are several scriptures that will point out those things. But then also, clearly as we said, the scriptures show that the Sabbath was terminated. The scriptures are emphatic that the requirement to keep the Sabbath has been terminated. New Testament data lead to the conclusion that the law of Moses, with all of its components, including the Sabbath, has been abrogated. 
Paul affirmed that the law of commandments was abolished through the cross. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 14 and following. Similarly, the bond written in ordinances which contained such things as feast days, sabbaths, etc. was taken out of the way having been nailed to the cross. Colossians chapter 2 verses 14 through 16. We looked at that passage at length when we looked at the two covenants. Because it was important to understand. You observe something here? That people who say there is moral law and ceremonial law. Say the ceremonial law was taken out of the way. But the moral law remained. But if you observe these passages of scripture. Like Colossians 2. Right? 14 to 16. We will see the bond written in ordinances. And this, those contain such things as feast days, sabbaths, etc. So sabbaths came closely aligned to feast days because the sabbath is not a moral principle it's a ritual so you had those nine moral principles in the decalogue and because god made that the heart of the covenant he included the sabbath observance in there because god was not making a distinction between moral and ceremonial sabbath would more qualify to be a ceremonial thing rather than a moral principle so understand what god did at sinai was to take eternal principles that always existed when cain slew his brother abel what did he do committed murder what does decalogue say thou shall do no murder was it only wrong when god said it at sinai no it was wrong way back when cain slew his brother and therefore there are what we call moral principles that even the Gentiles had to observe. And, and, and God established those moral principles in many different ways that people understood that these things were not right to do. And the patriarchs would speak about them. But here when God comes to Sinai now, God found it necessary. You know, okay, man knows. Take an example practical. People know they shouldn't speed on the highway. You think people don't know that? Of course everybody knows that. So we say, okay, generally in some areas, like you know, some residential areas, the speed limit there is lower, but on the highway, the speed limit is a little higher. But people take liberties because they now pave the road and they can real smooth and nice and you just tap in the gas and the car sailing away. So take excessive liberties. So how are you going to control that? You make a law. The speed limit is, say, 100 kilometers per hour. And if they put up that sign there and it says, you know, 100 km or pH, whatever, you know, uh, you break it. The policeman is charging you because you've broken a law. It's now become law. It's no longer just a, just a principle, it's a law. And because there's a law, you cannot claim ignorance. Because you've broken the law. So now God takes those moral principles and he makes them into a law. So that the Jews will realize, boy, here what's going on? A penalty for this thing, you know. Penalty. We can't, we can't break these laws. Penalty. But even those who were trying to keep them recognize that they were always falling short. So what would happen in a case like that? They needed somebody else to help them. So Sabbatarians allege, however, that only the ceremonial features, example, animal sacrifices of the Mosaic Covenant, they say only those features were abolished at the cross. The moral elements of the law, they say, example, the Ten Commandments, it is argued, continue to this very day. But I contend clearly, and you should see, that there's nothing moral about Sabbath observance. It's ritual. God, therefore, does not make a distinction between moral and ceremonial. God gave a covenant. So this position is arbitrary, artificial, and will not stand the test of scriptures if we observe a number of scriptures. God promised to make a new covenant, which would not be like the one given to Israel when the nation left Egypt. Jeremiah 31, 31 and following. We looked at that under the two covenants. What then... Or when, when that new covenant, so to speak, 
was given a change in laws, a change in laws was also made. So when God gave the new covenant, he also made a change in the laws that was made, Hebrews 7 and 12. But the old law, bestowed when Israel came out of Egyptian bondage, contained the Ten Commandments, 1 Kings 8, 9 and 21. Thus the Decalogue passed away when the Old Testament was replaced by the New. That's not hard to understand. In Romans 7, Paul argued that the Christian is dead to the law through the body of Christ. Romans 7 and verse 4. Watch this. He further contended, he further contended that the child of God is discharged from the law. Well, exactly what law is he talking about? What law is in view that the child of God, the Christian, is discharged from? You know, in the hospital and they discharge you, you're no longer there. You are out of there, separated from there. Well, here's what Paul says. For I had not known coveting. That's part of the word. Decalogue, right? For I had not known coveting, except the law had said, you shall not covet. So he just said you discharged from the law. And he's telling you the law from which you are discharged is the law that says thou shalt not covet. Which one is that? So understand what we are saying. It is not that because you are no longer under the law, the Ten Commandments, that you are free to do what you want. You have a new covenant. And in that new covenant, you have all those nine moral principles in it as well. But they are not in it as a legal system. They are in it as what James calls the perfect law of liberty. In other words, it's a system that says you need to observe me. But when you realize that you have faltered and fallen short, Christ offers through this system, it's a system where your faith in Christ allows you to access the forgiveness because you are not under a legal system that could not save you or provide that for you. So it is Christ that we honor and we observe and we trust for our salvation. If you have further questions, you can put it in the chat. We'll be glad to pick it up. We will review them, put a contact that we can reach you and we'll be happy to communicate with you. We hope that you have gained something. Remember, God bless you and keep you. Stay safe. Read the scriptures. Study until next time, I am a his person that bidding you, God bless. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. What the Bible tells me, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. That he died on Calvary, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. That he came to set me free in me. So I might live with him in glory. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe, I believe. When the Bible tells me I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he died on Calvary, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he came to set the people free So I might live with him in glory